Good evening and welcome to the 10th Inside Government Show for the fall 2020 semester here at Keogh Community College and broadcast on Spectrum, Verizon Fios, the Auburn Regional Media Access, better known as ARMA, as well as WIN 89.1, the college's radio station. I'm your host, Guy Cosentino. This is our final week of public affairs programming here at the college uh, due to the front-loaded lab schedule that we're using because of the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic. A reminder, the college's students direct, produce, and tape these shows, and we will have more on our Thursday shows. Uh, we're going to be doing two of them, one remotely. Uh, at the end of this show, we'll talk about those. Uh, tonight, though, we do have uh, back in the studio Auburn Superintendent of Schools, Jeff Carazola, to give us an update on the phased-in reopening of the Auburn School District. When he was here last, about a month and a half ago, Auburn was not fully back with online and offline schedules. We plan on talking to him about how the phased-in approach has been going, as well as how the district has dealt with some positive cases that have occurred at the elementary and high school level. We'll also talk to him about a case of uh, out-of-state remote learning that became a story in the Post Standard. And with no federal stimulus money at this point, and this is Election Day, we'll, we'll talk about what the look, outlook is for school financing uh, that has a third of his fiscal year already passed by. Welcome back to the studio. Thank you, Guy, for having me. Great to have you here. So uh, first and foremost, how's it going? <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting through it. Our doors are still open. Uh, we're are you very, surprised about that? I'm thankful for it. Um, you know, again, we didn't really know what was going to transpire, but, you know, right now we have seven active student cases, um, and we've really managed it well with contact tracing to keep our doors open. Uh, we have uh, four elementary classrooms that are completely remote. Um, we do have quite a few students that are quarantined throughout the district, um, but we're, we're still going. We're very thankful to be open. So before getting into the phased in, let's talk about the cases that you had. So you had uh, three at the elementary level? Uh, we have three at Casey Park. Three at Casey, I'm One sorry. at Seward, Seward, one at Herman, and one at the junior high, and one at the high school. And the high school one was also sports related Correct. as well. So we'll get to that. So uh, first of all, how were these students identified? Um, well, again, either we get contacted, the parents have been wonderful. Uh, parents will call us and tell them that. So you're not doing individual, like, so for example, here, everyone on staff, all the students, myself, my staff, we all get tested here. You're not doing individual testing at your schools no, as we, of yet right now. No, we, we are not. Um, if you get sent home from school sick, um, then one of the ways to get back is, is through a negative COVID test. So we do send about 30 students home a day with symptoms. So when you were here the last time, it was the week you had your first case, which was with an Owasco teacher. First of all, how's the Owasco teacher doing? He's doing wonderful. Okay, so wonderful. out of the woods and... Yeah, oh yeah, okay. absolutely. So, um, so are some of these, so when you say 30 go home, is that because they either fell ill during school or they got off the bus and they got a temperature check and they're way above what is normal? E either one. Okay. Um, they, they could have a temperature coming into school or they had come down with symptoms during the school day. And, um, <clears throat> but you're not shutting down schools at this point. So this is the interesting, I was talking to one of your old friends who's moved out of the state and he's asked, you know, what's Auburn doing? What's Jeff Carazola doing? I said, well, oddly enough, I'm having him on this afternoon. He goes, I read the paper the other day and they have not shut anything down except for individual classrooms or class levels. And that's been it. Yeah. Why, why not shut down a whole building? I think, I think our, our children need to be in school. I think they need in-person school. As long as we can keep it safe and keep it healthy, um, I think we need to continue. The, the one point that I want to emphasize, and again, knock on wood, um, is we have seven sporadic cases. None of those cases have caused a spread in our school buildings. So even though we've had a student come down at the elementary level, we are not seeing other classmates come down or the teacher come down with that. And are those, so let's take the Casey Park, because I think that was the first Correct. case. So the first, uh, Casey Park child is identified, you don't allow anybody else in that classroom back in. That includes the teachers, I'm assuming? Correct. So how do they get, that was now almost two weeks ago, am I correct? Yep. So are they back in school? Uh, they will be back very soon, yes. Okay, so how did they get back in school? So the quarant so half of the kids were quarantined, the other half were not because we're on an A-B hybrid schedule. So only the children that are in class 
with the positive case have to quarantine along so with the teacher. So you're really slicing and dicing to see you don't have to wipe out whole classrooms and whole grades or whole buildings at this stage. Correct. Because uh, because you said these are sporadic. Correct. So, all right, so you've identified those. How do they come back? So um, after the 14-day quarantine is over, um, all the kids will come back to school at that do point. Do they have to be tested again? Uh, no, they do not. Okay. No, nope, they do not. Um, once the quarantine is over, um, if they're not showing symptoms, they can come back to school. Um, so will the other, if the A class is out, the B class will start back up again. But what we do is we put the whole class out remotely, so then the teacher can continue to teach remotely from their home oh, so for the, all the students. So the, if this was an A student, in the B sections who are also out as well. Correct. We, okay. we make the whole classroom remote okay. so that way the teacher can keep in contact with all of them every day. So elementary wise <clears throat> with, with the cases we talked about uh, Casey, Seward, and Herman, how many children are affected in that? Usually in the average the classrooms have been around 18 um, because we do have 500 students throughout our district that are completely remote right. and they're in the remote academy. So most of our classes are around 20, um, you know, 18, somewhere around there. So usually we're, we're quarantining nine students. The other nine students are just going to a remote, transitioning to remote learning. So the bigger group, though, was at the high school. You had a, a soccer player yep. who was impacted. Uh, by the way, how are all these children? At, do, you, do you keep daily tabs on all uh, them? Yeah, so far they're, they're doing well. Okay. Um, you know, it, the, the students that... Um, have come down with it. The principals continue to stay in contact. So there's with not the any super spreader events, no. as far as you're no. uh, concerned. So that student also played on the soccer team. So you've also had to shut down the soccer team. Correct. So so our JV and boys soccer team have ended. Their, we only had two weeks left in the season. Okay. So um, we we've, we've canceled the rest of the season. Um, but all of our other sports teams are still up and running. Um, girls soccer and and cross country. Um, they're still going in field hockey. Do you have any worries about the remaining two weeks? Um, I have worries every night. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I worry every night. I, I kept my phones in the car so they didn't start ringing in okay. here. Um, but, yeah, when the health department number comes up on our phone, um, that's when I She'll be here on uh, she said <laughs> Kathleen Cuddy will be here on Thursday. I spoke to her about 15 times this weekend. <laughs> so, so um well, I want to get to that, but before, I don't want to leave sports because I, Auburn's a big sports town and it's mm -hmm. What aren't you playing at this stage that you had hoped when you were, you were hopeful back in September that you might get to play more, but what aren't you playing right So now? the three high-risk sports that we're not allowed to go were football, volleyball, and cheerleading. Okay. So what we've done is we've, we've moved them to fall season two, which is going to begin in March. And right now, what the conversation is, what are we going to do for winter sports? Because every one of our winter sports is pretty much a high-risk sport. Um, you have hockey, you have basketball, you have wrestling that are high-risk high, high sports. We have indoor winter track. The problem with that is we don't have any venues that we can participate in because usually we go to OCC, and they're not allowing any right. venues there. So uh, you have some familiarity with these winter sports. Your son's a great wrestler. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, so as a parent, forget being a superintendent, from a parent perspective, do you want them to play? Do you think it is safe for them to play? I know you want them to play. <laughs> There's a difference. Do you think it is safe for them to play winter sports at this stage? Well, and, and again, wrestling's in a league of its own because it's complete contact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, without a vaccine, without a treatment, um, you know, other states are doing it, and some of them are very successful. But I, I think, you know, it's, it's you you're rolling want, the dice with so it. So Luca's, a, your son is Luca. He's a senior. Mm -hmm. So this is an important year for him. It is. Um, as a parent, you wouldn't necessarily want him wrestling at this stage. I, I, I teeter back and forth okay. with it. You know, and the, and the reason we teeter back and forth, again, um, we know COVID's real. We know it's highly contagious. Um, we've been fortunate, though, the hospitalization rates and the death rates have been low, um, especially when you're talking students. Um, I do believe when he was wrestling back in March in, in the States, um, I'm sure COVID was rampant then, too, um, and we didn't see much sickness. But, but again, we have to be very cautious right now, especially with the second spike. 
So uh, I want to get into the second spike in a second, but I want to go back to contact tracing. So how is tracing done? So um, once we're contacted that we have a positive case, uh, I notify the principal. Um, I usually go meet with the principal. Elementary school, it's pretty easy because it's one pod. So we have the list of students right there that we need to quarantine and the ones that we need to move to remote uh, learning. But then what we do is we have conversation about teachers. Um, we already know the classroom teacher is going to be quarantined. But then we have to look at our special area teachers, our special ed teachers, our teacher aides, our lunch monitors, who's been in the room. And what we do is we look at any adult that has been in the room for an hour or more over, we use a 48 hour period because our kids are only in two days right. a week, um, but it could be a 48 to 72 hour period. Um, and if any adult has been in contact with that class for an hour or more, they have to self quarantine as well. And are you doing the contact tracing or is the uh, Cuyahoga County Health Department? We are doing the contact tracing. Um, but we do it in coordination with the health department. Uh, trust me, when I have a lot of questions, I call Kathleen right away. And so uh, you got a lot of kids who have siblings. Uh, Correct. And, uh, so if, if uh, let me just use Sally Smith. I hope it's not <coughs> Sally Smith. <who's laughs> yeah, your, yeah, you're good. So, so Sally Smith is a Casey Park student who's in the second grade. And Sally Smith's got a brother, Johnny Smith, who hopefully is not, again, not the uh, name who's at the junior high next door. Is he quarantined as well? Yes, yeah, so anybody that has direct contact with the positive case has to self-quarantine. So it's like patient A, B, and C. So patient A is the one in isolation, the one with COVID. Anybody that comes in direct contact with patient A would be patient B. They have to quarantine. Now, anybody that's come in contact with patient B, which would be patient C, they do not have to quarantine okay. unless patient B sure has sign. symptoms or test positive for COVID. Do you just think every, you know, I, I will tell you, the, I hate getting your calls at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm sure you hate making them. I certainly do. So for if you're not a parent out there, you have an alert system and it used to be, hey, by the way, pick up your candles at Herman Ave School because we're gonna sell. Now is we have a case at so-and-so. So, -and -so. so I, I know those are hard cases, uh, hard calls to make. Do you think that is going to be the regular I mean, I think last week, you, you literally called these, was it Friday or Sunday night, to apologize to parents? Friday, Friday, my last one on Friday, I did apologize because I No, but it was still appreciated. I, I can only say that from a parent. It's not easy to make this, but we are all, when we get that AESD alert, we know it's not, oh, you won the lottery. Right. The federal government just gave you stimulus. Correct, money. Okay. correct. I can't wait to make that call, though. And you should. <laughs> uh, so, um, so do you just think this continues on where every week you're going to be making two or three calls. We're not even in official flu season, or maybe we are in a flu season officially, but flu's now here, and kids are going to be showing those symptoms as well. Am I correct? Yeah, they are. And, and again, you know, when kids go get tested from here on out, they'll probably get tested both for the flu and for COVID. Um, but, yeah, I do think that those calls are going to continue. You did not receive a call from me last night, though. I did not. So, so that was a good thing. But Sunday night, yes, um, I, I, you know, we did contact tracing. Like I said at the high school, uh, Brian Morgan, Chris Mahar, myself, we were there for five hours on Saturday. Then Sunday, I was in my office while they were making calls for another five hours. So uh, I'm assuming this is all additional expense. Not, I'm not saying your time because your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my. Well, no, no, but it's valuable. But, but there's only a finite time. You, you're. If you're not doing it, you have to find somebody to do it. So are, are there ex additional expenses that the district, so for example, a teacher, uh, uh, student teacher, uh, parent teacher conversations occurred last week. So the one I was in, you have a teacher, uh, Mr. Bragg, who's very nice. You can see plexiglass in the reflection. Mm -hmm. um, those are all new expenses. I'm assuming in a lot of yeah. these elementary schools where you have two teachers, you put up plexiglass. Yeah, it's not for free. No, our our PPA our PPE expenses has been just like it is at the college. Um, I would say we've spent probably about four hundred thousand dollars up to this point. I'm projected between a million and one point three million this year. And as cases go <clears throat> up and you have more cases, like you have in the last two weeks, you c there's no way you can find enough time between you and your administrator, your immediate administrator, as you just mentioned, to make all those contact calls. 
We, yeah, we, we've got Are you going to have to hire people? Where, where's that? How do you pay for that? You know, um, usually what happens is at the end of the day, we just stay at nighttime and, and do all the contact tracing. On the weekends, um, we just come in. I bring the administrators in, and, you know, they, they can get comp time but for other that, work, but it's an expense. But other work's not getting done. Correct. It, it, that's the point I'm trying to make. At some point, you, do have, you are going to have to, from a management point of view, farm some of this stuff out. Yeah, you know, it, it, we, we will um, if, if the numbers continue to go up. If they go up that, mu that much, uh, unfortunately for us, especially if we become a yellow zone, um, we'll probably end up having to go to complete remote. What is a yellow zone? Uh, so, so the governor's come out with a yellow, orange, and red zone. Um, if on a rolling seven-day average, if our, our uh, increase in cases hits 3.5%, we have to go to a yellow zone. I believe as, sun, as of Sunday, I believe it was around 2.2%. So we're getting closer to that 3.5%. And when you say yellow, does that mean closing all schools or just what, specific? What that means is we would have to do 20% of testing every week. So in a school district our size, um, with about 4,900 students and staff members, 20% of that we would be doing over 900 tests a week. So I know here, Dr. Durant sat in that chair maybe a month ago, and he said that alone is costing him almost a quarter of a million dollars new. Correct. And, and I don't know if we have the capacity to do that in this county because it wouldn't be just our school district doing it. It would be every school district in the county doing that. Oh, so it's by, when you say zones, it's not just your school. It's, it's by county. Uh, okay. So, so I, I don't know if we would be able to even be able to handle that type of testing. So for protocols for closure, if, if you get to that point, uh, you're surprised, we talked about, you're, you're, you're pleasantly surprised that you're happy that you're still open. What, you, you mentioned what a trigger would be, would that be that two, or th that three point? Three point five percent, yeah. Are there other things that could trigger it? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the amount of cases we get in, in, in our buildings as well. Here's one of our biggest issues. At the high school, I guess we can say we were fortunate. Um, we only had to have three teachers quarantine at the high school. Um, <clears throat> but it could be up to nine to 12 for any single student case. We can't get substitutes. Um, there, there's nobody substituting in our buildings. Because they don't want to substitute? I, I think it's because of safety concerns, safety. yeah. Um, so we talked about the governor and about you. Um, what's the decision-making process you will go through? Is this solely up to you? It is. It okay. is. Um, you know, of course, I speak with the Board of Education as well. I keep them informed of what I'm doing. But if we get, just in this case alone with one high school student with the soccer team, we had to quarantine about 65 students um, and three teachers. If we have another student or two students and we have to quarantine another 75 to 100 students plus 9 to 18 teachers, that would make us have to go to remote. Um, at the high school. It doesn't mean we have to go remote district-wide. I'm looking at each one building specific. And I don't want to get so much buried into the, the, the financial side of this, but this is going to become more and more of an issue for you. Like we said, you're a third of your, through your, a third of your fiscal year right now. You had hoped for federal aid by now. It yeah. may determine what the outcome of today, Election Day, is, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but um, by going to remote, so when you phased in, mm -hmm. let's take a step back. When you phased in, you are fully phased in right now. You have some students who are remote, and you have some students who are either in the A or B section, so Monday, Tuesday, Monday Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and then Friday, you can tell me what that is later. But, okay. But with that, that's how you, you are in, fully implemented in that system. That was not the original plan, but you are implemented in that system now, correct? Correct. So how many are in school, whether they're in the A or B, of your population of roughly 4,900? Uh, we have about 4,200. 4, 4,200. So of the 4,200, how many are remote and how many, when I say remote, they're fully remote. They're not in at all. And how many are doing a combination of remote in the classroom? So when we first started, we were right about 1,000, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,100. We've gone up quite a bit. 
in the last few weeks. More remote? More remote just because of the outbreaks in the community. More more parents are, are more nervous. So those are parent decisions. <clears throat> yep. So so we're probably we're probably between twelve and thirteen hundred completely remote right now. So did you so this is where my financial question comes in. Do you have to put in some infrastructure with new staffing or more staffing to do remote classrooms uh, and remote studies that you would not have if everybody was doing A, B? Well, we're, right now um, we're, we're maintaining with the staff we have. So we're one of the only school districts that are running a complete remote academy. We have 21 teachers that teach our remote elementary students. Unfortunately, now with the increase number of cases, positive cases in the community, more parents want their kids going remote. We can't offer them any of the remote academy because our classrooms are filled. So you've lot you you and that what happens to those the children that you've got in quarantine? Do they automatically get into the remote classroom because No, the kids that are in quarantine at the elementary, their whole classrooms remote. Okay. So their teachers okay. teaching remotely to that entire class. So a parent who wants their uh, there are no more remote slots. Correct. So, so what they do is they go remote using the classroom, current classroom teacher they have, and they can still go online into Google Classroom, go through the recordings that are up there and all the assignments. All the assignments for all five days are in Google Classroom. So that's what they're doing. It's more self-directed for them. And is that five days a week compared to the four days that other elementary no no the remote the remote academy is still four days because on the okay. fifth day teachers are still planning and getting all of those lessons out and um, a, as you go through this have there been what challenges have you had whether it's been the with the remote or the the hybrid which we'll call the a B system I, I mean when the kids are in school there there are no issues our, our kids are doing well so there's you have really haven't had some operational challenges there. No, but our 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 issues are technology based. Um, you know whether Chromebooks are breaking, um, some of the hotspots aren't working. Um, what feedback are you getting from uh, from teachers? From teachers, not the, the teachers are more concerned with students that we can't engage. Um, that's one of our bigger issues. Is the kid who's lounging in their bed. Some of the when students that aren't engaging in, in the remote learning, um, some of the same issue we had back in March. So last year, we, we joked that you were your own truant officer. Yeah, that's right. So I'm thinking truancy is a whole different realm now. And I, I think you and I did an interview with Neil O'Brien, who's Port Barn, mm -hmm. and, and they he talked about a graduated, if you don't get on at 9 o'clock, you don't get on at 11, and I can't remember the other. They have, do you have a similar system yeah. where if a student's not on, somebody's calling a parent? Yeah, we are social workers. One thing that we did not take out of our budget this year is we do have a social worker in every one of our buildings this year. They're doing daily check-in with families. So is our school psychologists, our counselors, our administrators. Um, and we're actually still doing home visits. Um, what feedback <clears throat> are you getting from parents? Um, again, it's a mixed. We have some parents that have been very happy with what's going on. We have other parents that say that we're given too much work or we're not giving enough work. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's the whole gamut. So let me ask you a couple of parent questions. That have, I'm assuming these are parents who sent questions in. So you've, one viewer wanted to know, you, you have specials, which are your art gym, library, mm -hmm. and music. Uh, how are they being handled now? Um, well, we do do them. We, were one, we are one of the only school districts that are doing them in our hybrid model. So if the kids are in school, they're getting it through school. Um, if they're completely remote, then the teachers are putting lessons or activities online for them. So this must be apparent because they said this has become an extra burden on parents. Mm -hmm. They just look at it. It's hard enough to just do the, 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 core, the core reading, subjects. writing, yeah. and arithmetic. Why do the, the, uh, the specials on top of it? You know, again, it's, it's the full child. It's the whole child. Will they be graded? Um, well, every, everything is graded, well, but, we, but we do like under... Like a 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D, or pass, fail. I, I think our teachers are, are knowing enough to um, be sensitive to that because some of our kids are overwhelmed, some of our parents are overwhelmed, um, but we don't want to deny the kids the opportunity. There are kids that love art, music, phys ed, 
and, and um, you know, libraries. So we want to make sure that they have that there. I would tell parents, do what you can. Yeah, really concentrate on the core subjects. And, and the encore ones are there, too, and, and they're just as important. But you can only do what you can handle. So that leads to a different parent question. Uh, their child apparently has gym and library uh, okay. twice a week, but they're not getting music. I don't know what I missed. Art must be. Are you going to rotate these? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we will be rotating those by semester. And how about you have some holidays coming up? So you had, um, you had Columbus Day, which is a Monday, which would be an A. You've got a A next Veterans week Day. with Veterans Day. How are you going to make up those dates? We're, we're talking about, and, and I've got to work with some of the with some of our uh, teachers union and them about maybe using a Friday to get a makeup day for those um, A. So that's on the radar. A days. Then, oh yeah, we're very well aware of that. Uh, how about how are you handling snow break or snow days? Uh, again, snow days may become remote days. Um, you know, I, I, we're going to talk to the union about that as well. Um, but instead of losing days, um, being able to do it remotely, I think, is a, a great way to handle it. Teachers can still stay home, be safe. Um, you know, and, and we could actually call a remote day the night before. If we know and we're predicting snow, maybe we just move to a remote day so parents can make plans and, and get everything set. Teachers can bring their stuff home with them so they don't have to worry about them being at school. So um, I, I think it's a, a smart way to go. Um, <clears throat> any idea right now whether you'll keep spring break or not? I, I would think so. I, I don't think you have a winter break and a spring break, and I know they're your favorites by far. <laughs> <laughs> February. Well, in, in in our February, you would like to either get rid of one or combine them, but well, and that's a bigger issue. It, we don't it is, but it. but I do think they'll be maintained. Because I know um, colleges, for example, are considering, uh, and that's partially because they don't need them to go to Miami. Right, and uh, I think that's know. smart. Put it at the end of the semester. So we have about five more minutes left uh, with some questions. Uh, that was a hint to the control room uh, <laughs> on this, because there were two, uh, two health issues that I wanted to talk about. First of all, I want to talk about this, uh, this Emmett case, and you may not be able to get into the specifics of this, but what is the policy, and this leads to a bigger question, what is the policy about a resident or non-resident in Auburn tuning in remotely to be a student? Uh, you know, speaking broadly, um, you know, you, you have to reside in the school district that you go to. So how do you prove that? Well, you, you, you live in a house, you've got bills, you've got, but you're, you're actually physically in that house. So in this particular case, there was a case, that, let me just give you a hypothetical. Okay. We'll call them, they lived in Eagle Rock, let's say Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they found out by a letter that they had exited the community. First of all, what does exited the community mean? Well, and again, um, exited out of a school district would mean that um, you're you, you're not attending our school district. So how do you find out that stuff? Does somebody report it in? Uh, there, there's there's plenty of ways. Okay, I, I can say the case has been resolved. No, I, and I'm going to get yeah, to that, but I think it leads yeah. to a different question. So this is a different question about equity. We know there are a lot of school districts that are a lot worse shape than ours. Correct. What prevents someone from saying, you know what, I'm in a horrible, I don't want to give them a Smith School District. Hopefully there's not a Smith School District. I know my kid's not getting a great education there. But Auburn, they'll let me in because they don't have a residency requirement. How do you prevent that? This goes to this fair and equitable issue, which is a much broader issue. Right. Are you worried about that? Is no, no, we, we have a residency requirement. We have kids that pay tuition to come to Auburn um, that don't reside here. Um, and, and, you know, we, we follow the law when it comes to that. But, you know, that, that's to say if, a, if somebody owns four houses, um, I own one in, in Auburn, Skinny Atlas, Cato, and Moravia, well, where do you reside at? You have to physically reside in one of those houses. You can't go to just Skinny Atlas right. when you reside in Auburn. So you have to reside there. You know, the biggest thing is we have to know if, if somebody is leaving, when are they returning by? Give us a return date. That way we can process it and, and figure it out. So, so really is the return date is the most important part of that conversation when you have that. Um, I do want to talk about health, but let's go right to finances because I think there's a at this point, what are you projecting your budget looking like 
yeah, in the next couple and, of months. And again, you're, you're right, the election's going to have a big, big play on this um, and what we're going to look at. The, the problem for school districts is when are we going to know the results of the presidential election, right? So the dates I've been hearing is you either know tonight because somebody wins big or loses Correct. big. You wait till the courts get to it, and there's an electoral college on the 14th, I think 12th or 14th of uh, 18th of December, or you wait till January 20th. Well, you wait till January 20th, you're halfway, you're more than, you're right. almost 65% uh, through your, excuse me, 55% of your school fiscal year. How do you deal with that? Well, and again, Governor Cuomo is not changing his story. He is saying we're going to get a 20% cut in our aid, which is about $9.5 million. So without a federal stimulus package coming in to help us, um, I think that school districts in New York State are going to be in deep trouble. But you don't think you can wait to hear from the state until January to make that type of <clears throat> sizable cut? No, I, I think by December, we've got to really be looking at this by December. So he had said um, that he was not going to make any decision until after today, Election Day. Uh, you weren't surprised by that? No, not at um, all. Does that mean, do you think that was wise for him to wait till the election is over? I, I think he's trying to put more pressure on the federal government to, to come out with some type of, of bailout reform. So whatever happens tonight, and we may not know the results for a couple of days or weeks, are you worried that the you should be braced for a 20% cut and that shoe could drop later this week, within the month? I think within the month we should be hearing something and, and again, you know, our people in Albany, our, our superintendents group and, and uh, SED is really keeping a pulse on that um, and they're asking questions every day. So hopefully within the next month we'll have an answer to that. If you get a $9 million shortfall, does that mean layoffs? Does that mean teacher cuts? What, what does that, how do you implement nine, well what's your fund balance? Uh, our fund balance is about 4%, so, you know, it's about $3.5 million. Okay, so that doesn't, if you went to the rainy day fund, which you maybe even legally can't drain it all down, right. you're still short six. Yep. How do you make that up? Well, I will tell you, we had a good fiscal year last year. We're expecting a good rollover. Um, so, you know, we will have some rollover money, um, but when it's all said and done, there, there would have to be some type of layoffs. Um, I, I don't. I don't see, I, I think the federal government has to have some type of stimulus package for school districts um, because there's school districts in New York State that will shut their doors. So it may be that Washington doesn't give New York money. New York may have to just tighten its belt and it, give money to districts. It, it, something's going to have to play out that way because too many school districts just will not. Because all we're talking about is Washington and Albany. We've not been talking about Albany right, right. And, and stepping up to the plate. Correct. And yeah. somebody's going to have to. And we, we understand that schools, you know, we, we, it's a lot of money to run school right. districts in New York State as well as health care. So uh, we hope you'll come back in, I guess we're starting in early January or mid-January. I could come late. back next week. I know you can. And we, and we did, when we walked out the last time we talked about it, we will keep, create a special spot for you. It happened to be election Good. day because there is so much going on in the district and you've got a fiscal, when will you start planning your budget? Uh, we, we usually start January, but the conversations are gonna probably start November this year. Okay. We hope you keep all your kids in school. Me too. We hope you keep your doors open. We hope you keep everybody safe. Thank That's you That's all very we much. ask for. Yep, thank you uh, very much. So our guest has been Auburn Superintendent of Schools, Jeff Parazola. We wanna again thank him for making the time today to give us an update. It is not an easy job right now to run our schools and we hope he'll join us in late January or early February when he will know uh, what is happening financially, whether there is a stimulus funding from Washington or Albany or cuts from one or the other. On Thursday we'll have our final day of taping uh, here uh, at the college. We'll have two shows uh, for the fall 2020 season to end. The first will be excuse me, Cuga County Public Health uh, Director Kathleen Cuddy who is most likely the most popular person when it comes to school districts, who will give us a COVID-19 update. And we'll also ask her about vaccines in the current flu season and what's likely underway. We hope to follow that with an interview with Senator James Seward uh, to give us a legislative update as we did with Gary Finch last week at the Assemblyman, and also talk about his career as he also has decided not to seek reelection, having represented Cuyahoga County in the uh, New York State Senate on and off for over 34 years. 
As usual, you can send us your ideas for questions as you did for Mr. Perizzola to uh, Inside Government, P.O. Box, uh, excuse me, uh, Inside Government, 141 Dunning Avenue, Auburn, New York, 13021, or by email at cozguitho at aol.com. I'm Guy Cosentino for Community College, and uh, thank you for watching. Hope you have a good night and have a great tomorrow, and we'll see you back here in the studio on Thursday, and please be safe.